This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. Today, we're all going to go back to school to get an old-fashioned lesson in American history. One of the reasons we're doing this is because, well... How many American citizens know why or how the presidential inauguration ceremonies even got started? Let me be the first to admit that although I'm invited every four years to attend the festivities surrounding the swearing in of our next president, frankly, I know very little about the reason for all the hoopla. So I decided this week we should speak to everyone's favorite American historian, H.W. Brands. He's going to join us in just a few minutes to talk about some of our country's great traditions and legacy. But before he does, let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Henry William Brands was born in Portland, Oregon. He attended Stanford University, where he studied history and mathematics. After graduating from Stanford in 1975, Brands took a job selling cutlery, a position which covered a large territory from California to Colorado. And this allowed him to see a great deal of the West firsthand. But it didn't take long before his love of academia got the better of him, and he found himself teaching history and mathematics at high school and a community college for almost a decade. In the meantime, he resumed his own education, completing his Ph.D. in history from the University of Texas at Austin in 1985. In addition to teaching at Vanderbilt, Texas A&M, and the University of Texas at Austin, Brands has managed to author more than 25 critically acclaimed history books, including one of my favorite all-time reads, The First American, The Life and Times of Benjamin Franklin. He has been a Pulitzer finalist numerous times and has appeared in more historical documentary films, television, and radio programs. And we have time to go into today. Mr. Brands is the Dixon Allen Anderson Centennial Professor. That's a mouthful. Professor of History and Professor of Government at the University of Texas at Austin. It's my great pleasure to have with us today a man who is not only a learned historian but also a master storyteller, Mr. H. W. Brands. Welcome to the program, Dr. Brands. Well, thanks so much. I'm delighted to be with you. First, let me congratulate you on the success of your book, The Man Who Saved the Union, Ulysses Grant in War and Peace. Grant was one of our country's most important leaders, both during the Civil War and after. And speaking of leaders, the all-important swearing in of our country's president is upon us. And as you know, it's a jam-packed day for President Obama and Vice President Biden. But as I understand it, the festivities dragged on for 10 days, five days before the inauguration, five days after, until Richard Nixon's second term when they were cut short by the passing of Lyndon B. Johnson. So what can you tell us about all the pomp and circumstances that uh, we're about getting ready to witness? Like so much about the presidency and about our political system generally, these grew up almost on their own. There's nothing in the Constitution that says there shall be an inaugural ceremony. The president shall swear an oath, that's true, but that could easily be done just in private. The president is required by the Constitution to report periodically on the State of the Union. So the State of the Union address, that's written in the Constitution. But the inaugural address, this is something that happened and continues to happen in large part because George Washington did it. And if it was good enough for Washington, it's been good enough for everybody else. Over the years, the festivities have grown and shrunk depending on the context, depending on the popularity of the president. The first really big blowout inaugural ceremony was the inauguration of Andrew Jackson in 1829. Mm -hmm. Jackson was the first ordinary man to be elected president, the first one outside the realm of, you could call it, they didn't exactly call it in those days, the East Coast elite, but that's what they were talking about. And thousands of his followers descended on Washington, in part to make sure that he did indeed get inaugurated. They suspected his predecessor, John Quincy Adams, of having diabolical plans to somehow keep their hero from being inaugurated. So this was peer pressure. Well, it was peer pressure. It was also it was also a symbol of the emergence of democracy. Because ordinary people elected Jackson. And until the Jacksonian era, most ordinary people, even among adult white males, could not vote. But with the Jacksonian era and with the election of Jackson, for the first time ordinary people could embrace the office of the president. Jackson was widely accounted the people's president in a way that 
previous presidents had not been. Just as a bit of somewhat historic trivia, until the 1820s, popular voting was not usually the way elector, even elects were chosen. Today we know, of course, that presidents are chosen officially by the elector, the electoral college. Yes. But, but our electors are chosen by popular vote. Until the 1820s, as often as not, they were chosen by state legislators. Mm-hmm. So with the Jacksonian era, the presidency became the people's office. And the fact, for example, that the inauguration is held outdoors is a gesture in this direction. Because when a president looks out over the mall, there can be 600,000 people, as are predicted for next Monday. There could be 3 million people, as attended the first Obama inauguration. There's really no end to the size of the audience when the president is inaugurated outdoors. And the people are there to bear witness. The people are there to bear witness. Now, most of them, of course, can hardly see the president or can hardly hear the president, but they have a chance to be there. And for particularly historic inauguration. Now, you never know that an inauguration is historic, usually until after the fact. But for John Kennedy's inauguration in 1961, for example, when it was really clear that a new generation had taken power, and Kennedy played on that with his theme, with the theme of his inaugural address, in which he said the torch has been passed to a new generation. People, especially who were born in the 20th century, who had been at most young adults during the Depression and World War II, really felt that there was this transition now. Now, one of their own was president. Exactly the same thing when Andrew Jackson was inaugurated. In Jackson's case, the White House, Jackson, opened, was opened to ordinary people. They had this reception at the White House, and there was a tremendous brawl that took place. As <laughs> hordes of people descended on the White House, they wanted to get their hands on the food and on the cider, the punch. They burst through the windows when the, they broke windows. They, they stomped on the furniture. They tore down the drapes. They nearly suffocated Jackson in their enthusiasm. He had to escape through a back door. When President Obama was inaugurated. Yeah, well, he, he, I guess he, did, he didn't have the security he needed. Well, no, but, but everybody knew that that was a historic inauguration. because You get a sense that some things are going to be historic. I mean, in this particular case, we have the first black president, and a lot of people wanted to witness that. That's exactly it. There were all sorts of people who wanted to be able to tell, to tell their kids and grandkids, I was there when Barack Obama was inaugurated. And in that case, the historic nature of the inauguration transcended by far what was said in the inaugural address. So I speak as a historian here. Historians are going to write about that inaugural ceremony 50 years from now. They probably won't quote the inaugural address. It was pretty good, but it wasn't particularly memorable. The memorable thing about the occasion was the fact that a black man had been elected president and now was the leader of the United States, a mere, what, 150 years or so after the end of slavery. Right, right. I think you do get a sense, though, I mean, as a historian, you must get a sense that this is a moment. I mean, after reviewing what criteria makes for important historical intersections, you must just get a sense of that, don't you? Well, you do. And in that regard, I have to say that most inaugural ceremonies don't survive the test of time. So, as I say, I write history books, and... There are only a handful of inaugurations that I would include in, let's say, a general history of the United States, because we get them every four years. And so something big has to happen to make them stand out. Well, I'll tell you what, we have to take a short commercial break. So when we come back, let's talk about the the few that do stand out and the reasons that they did stand out. You're listening to the Costa Report. We all know that the wrong time to start planning is when we're under fire and there is no time to plan. 
But it's also true that most of us are not prepared for when we, or a family member, suddenly needs expensive nursing home care. Take your estate, for example. Whether it's small or large, how sure are you that your will is legal? Are your children poised to avoid costly probate and reap the benefits of what you want them to have? Or will they be left, like seven out of 10 families are each year, with piles of paper and no idea what your intentions were? My name is John Lawton, and I have been helping families through their most difficult transitions in life for over three decades. Beginning in January, I'll be answering your questions about estate planning and elder care in a new segment on the Costa Report called Family Matters. We'll talk about everything from your care, your children, your pets, and your peace of mind. So join me every Friday, starting in January, right here on your favorite weekly news program, The Costa Report. and we listened. The new and improved paperback edition of The Watchman's Rattle is now available in bookstores everywhere, including airports across the country. If you've been hemming and hawing about not having time to go online or pick up a copy, well, now you don't have any excuses. Find out why government gridlock, terrorism, epidemic obesity, crime on Wall Street, even problems with education and health care have an evolutionary basis to them. Because when you do, you'll never look at our problems the same way. So pick up the freshly printed paperback edition of the Watchman's Rattle. Don't wait. Do it now. Give yourself a real reason to feel optimistic. That's the Watchman's Rattle, available everywhere you are. And now a word from your local Hydrex Pest Control. Hello, I'm Ken Walton, your local branch manager with Hydrex. Hydrex Pest Control has expanded. In addition to our standard pest control and termite services, we now offer lawn care, weed control, and live animal trapping. With over 30 years combined experience, we offer high quality service for an affordable price. Call your local Hydrex today at 1-800-318-1162 or www.hydrexnow.com. Hydrex Pest Control. Look for the sign of the spider. Welcome to Automated Computer Services, America's most drawn-out tech support line. One moment, please. For a full listing of our personnel, press 1. Please enter the person's full name, starting with their last, then their first, followed by their bank account number and their birth date. I'm sorry, there is nobody here by that name. For a full listing of our staff, press 1. To speak with a customer service representative, press 2. Your current wait time is 4 hours and 37 minutes. Please enjoy the music. Tired of unfriendly computer support? Slow computer? Viruses? Spyware? No problem. Call the friendly computer experts at User-Friendly Computing. We take care of all your PC, Macintosh, and laptop needs. Mention KSCO and get a free $50 diagnostic. Visit us today at 505 River Street on the way to downtown Santa Cruz, across from Gateway Plaza. We give you a choice. Drop your computer by the shop, or we'll come to you. Call us today at 423-9653. User-friendly computing. Tune in to the Sentinel Radio Program Saturday morning at 8 a.m. right here on AM 1080 KSCO. Brought to you by First Church of Christ Scientist Monterey. Come into our Christian Science Community Reading Room and Bookstore and find comfort from the challenges you're facing. We have the resources that will connect you with your God-given substance. Find help now. Our address is 780 Abrego Street in Monterey. Reach out for this help today. Come in and visit or call 831 831- 372-5076. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is acclaimed American historian and author H.W. Brands. And before the break, you were just starting to tell us about some of the inauguration ceremonies that survived the test of time. Well, the first one was George Washington's, and that was because that inaugurated not only his presidency, but the American Republic under the new Constitution. In 1801, Thomas Jefferson was inaugurated. This was the first time there had been a transfer of power from one party to the other. It had been a very bitter campaign, and Jefferson made a point of trying to mend fences. The two major parties were the Republicans and the Federalists. And Jefferson famously said, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. No one really believed him, but it was a nice gesture. (laughs) When Jackson was inaugurated in 1829, ordinary people in America took over. They had this brawl at the White House, but it demonstrated that the presidency was the people's office. 
when Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated in 1861. Seven southern states had already seceded, and the country wanted to know what the reaction of the president was going to be. Lincoln tried to persuade the rest of the South not to secede, but he made very clear that though he had no designs against slavery per se, he was going to hold the Union together. Mm -hmm. um, Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated in 1933. He had been elected at the depth of depression, and everybody wanted to know what this new president was going to do. Mm -hmm. And, and um, Franklin Roosevelt said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And he tried to exert a calming effect on the country at the bottom of the Depression. And he largely succeeded. When John Kennedy was inaugurated in 1960, as I mentioned earlier, it was clear that there was this new generation that was taking power. When Ronald Reagan was inaugurated in 1981, the 1970s, especially the later 1970s, had been emotionally and economically very different, very difficult for Americans. And Reagan, again, tried to offer reassurance. And as we mentioned earlier, when Barack Obama was inaugurated in 2009, the first time an African-American had become president of the United States, it was a historic moment in its own right. So given the current climate of the nation right now, our economy is, I mean, we just came off of some negotiation over the fiscal cliff, and I don't really even want to go there because that, if there was another example of kicking the can down the road. I mean, there was a the, the, here we go again. In this instance, where it's a second term, what could the president do to make this inauguration speech, his comments, what can he do for the nation to make this memorable? Well, acute listeners in your audience will have noticed that all of the inaugurations I mentioned were first inaugurations. Yes, they were. A second inauguration, a second inauguration is a tough second act. And of the second inaugural addresses and the second inaugurations, really two stand out. There's Lincoln's second inaugural address. This one stands out for the fact, first of all, that it came right at the end of the Civil War. And everybody was listening to see what Lincoln would say about how the Union would be knitted together. Uh -huh. And when his inaugural address called for, he said, with malice toward none, with charity toward all, let us bind up the nation's womb. So he, Lincoln had been the wartime leader, and now he was going to lead the country to peace. Of course, one of the things that lent historical significance to that particular inaugural address was the fact that Lincoln was assassinated a month later. So there was a drama that was added ex post facto to those words. And then Franklin Roosevelt's second, inaug second inaugural address in 1936. Roosevelt had just won a landslide re-election, but the country was still deep in the Depression. And Roosevelt basically took the position, we have accomplished a lot. And indeed, he had. The unemployment rate had gone from 25% down to 15%. A lot of people had hope, again, who hadn't had hope four years earlier. But he said, a lot more needs to be done. And this is the inaugural address in which Roosevelt said, I see one-third of a nation ill-clothed, ill-housed, ill-fed. But I think in each case that you bring up, there's a context in which the inauguration is taking place. There's a moment, and the president steps into that moment. Is there a moment now? There is. I think Americans realize that the country is at some kind of crossroads. The, the future which had always seemed so bright for America for about the last 150 years, has been called into question. There are deep questions among very many people about whether the country is even governable at all, whether the president and Congress can come up with any resolution to the very deep problems that face the country. There are deep questions about the American economy. People, there... feel, people feel that life has gotten harder it's more complicated. And what they see from leaders is bickering and gridlock. It seems to me that there's a wonderful opportunity to step in there and say, we, we have to come together. It, 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 no matter what, what compromises we have to make, to oppose each other is the definition of gridlock. There's no question that President Obama has an opportunity. This is a moment when the country is going to be focused on him. In a way, it hasn't been for a long time, until throughout the campaign, President Obama would give a speech, Governor Romney would give a speech. And so there was always this balance. And 
The way the media have developed in this country, it's very easy for people to tune in to the TV station, the radio network that suits their views and not have to listen to the other side. But inaugural address is a moment when every radio station, every television network will be tuned in. The president has a chance to reach out to all Americans, not simply the ones who are already disposed to agree with them. That's he, right. We have no distractions whatsoever. So what does he need to say? Ah, well, what he needs to do, I think, is to cast a vision. He has to explain where he wants the country to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now. One of the things about presidents in second terms is that they are suddenly emancipated from the short-term imperatives that wrap up politics most of the time. Right, they're not going to run again. That's exactly it. They have run and won their last race, their last campaign. And so, but people say that to me. They say, well, he's got nothing to lose. He can really go for it. He can state his agenda and he can go for it. But then I say, you don't understand. He's part of a, a, a party. And the party still wants to run somebody four years from now. Right, but the president is as much liberated from his own party as he is from the opposite party in some ways, because he doesn't have to, he, a president can, if he wants to, portray himself once again as president of all the people, not simply president of his own party. A president who simply tries to promote the interests of his party almost certainly will fail in a second term, even when that president has been reelected overwhelmingly. Franklin Roosevelt is the very good illustration of this. He had this huge victory in 1936, but he governed primarily as a leader of the Democratic Party. And he alienated Republicans. He actually even alienated conservatives in his own party through his attempt to pack the Supreme Court with favorable justice. Well, now we hope that we don't get a repeat of that, that's for sure. And we have to take another commercial break. When we come back, let's find out what President Obama's legacy is likely to be. You're listening to the Costa Report. here today with Scott Caraccioli, owner of Caraccioli Cellars. I have to say that every time that I've been by, it has been packed with people. It's more of a social environment. Yeah, it's really kind of a meeting place as well in Carmel. A lot of people come and taste a flight of wines before they go to dinner. We have a big screen TV in there. We feed all the games that are local and important, and it definitely becomes a meeting place for people. So you must get a lot of first dates there, maybe? You know, we get a lot of first dates, second dates. A lot of times it's couples that do come in, and we see them again after the first time. I can imagine, and I would suggest that if anyone's thinking about a first date, that might be a really nice place to kick it off. One more time now, where is the tasting room located and what are your hours? We're located right in the heart of Carmel by the Sea, right on Dolores between Ocean and 7th. We're open daily from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. And on Fridays and Saturdays, we actually open up at 11 and stay open till 10 p.m. I will never forget the day my son Jeremy told me he hated me and slammed the door in my face. I'm behavioral therapist Janet Lehman. Behavior problems can turn the child you love and your life into a nightmare. That's why my husband James and I created the Total Transformation, the step-by-step -step program that shows you how to fix the worst behavior problems and get your child to respect and listen to you again. No matter what the behavior, defiance, backtalk, angry outbursts, disrespect, we can help you stop it. Now you can get the Total Transformation for free. All you need to do is get the program and let us know how it works for you. You can keep it forever for free. Limited number of free programs available. Call now. 1-888-535-1061. 1-888-535-1061. That's 1-888-535-1061. 1-888-535-1061. Eight, 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 
You were really smart to wait for the January clearance sale to get the best deals. Well, it's January, and we're clearing out the store. So come and get the best deals of the year. Hello, I'm Kat from Home Concepts Furnishings in Santa Cruz. Home Concepts is having its annual January clearance sale, and you will find the best prices of the year on our huge selection of furniture for the home and office, including all top names like Flex Steel and Lane, Tempur-Pedic and Diamond, Jonathan Lewis, Robert Michael, and Ashley. Here are some of the deals you'll find at Home Concepts January clearance sale. Sofa and love seat from $6.99. Table and four chairs from $4.99. And sectionals beginning at $6.99. The boss wants big numbers from our January clearance sale. We aim to make him happy. That means we're marking everything way, way down at Home Concepts Furnishings. You've waited long enough. The deals are now at Home Concepts January clearance sale at 2000 Soquel Avenue in Santa Cruz. We have lots of parking, free coffee, and the best prices you'll find anywhere. If electricity flows through it, you can save a lot of money by doing it yourself with the help of the experts at Santa Cruz Electronics. Hello, Charlie Friedman here. Listen to the things your friends and neighbors are doing for themselves with the help of Santa Cruz Electronics. Microwave repair. Robotic arm with controller for E-Shed industrial arm. Tesla coil for my rail gun. Dead tricks upgrades. Drive for a telescope. A tube amp for my guitar. Submersible sensors for NASA. Ethernet cable for my new iMac. Solar powered gate. Instrument panel for an airplane. Wiring my hot rod. Upgrading PC system. Help with home wiring. Custom audio cables for recording studio. High voltage electronic ignition circuit. Building a spaceship. If electricity flows through it, you can save a lot of money by doing it yourself with the help of the experts at Santa Cruz Electronics. Voted best electronics store two years running. Call Santa Cruz Electronics today at 831-479-5444 or visit at 2808 SoCal Avenue in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz Electronics. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is historian, author, and master storyteller, H.W. Brands. Before the break, you were saying that a second-term president is in many ways emancipated from the pressures of running for another term and even from forwarding the interests of their own party. Um, and I think you were continuing to talk about the fact that in Roosevelt's case, uh, he was beholding to his party. Well... Sometimes what happens is that presidents can get carried away with their success. With Roosevelt, it was an attempt to pack the Supreme Court. Richard Nixon got carried away and wound up having to resign his office. And in large part because his victory was so large, he kind of lost touch with reality. Um, when Ronald Reagan was reelected in 1984, it was a resounding victory. But Reagan then struck a bipartisan theme. And I think it's probably fair to say that most successful second-term presidents manage to achieve some kind of bipartisan result. And so we were talking about President Obama. With the Republicans in control of the House of Representatives, quite clearly he's going to have to get the cooperation of Republicans if any progress is going to be made on the budget, on taxes, on immigration, on pretty much anything. He can prevent hostile legislation from going through. He has a veto. But he can't get anything positive through without some bipartisan cooperation. Okay, well, that brings up a good question. I mean, there I don't think anybody's going to debate that a large part of Ob the Obama legacy will be that he was the America's first black president. But let's look beyond that. In your view, what other historical importance is his presidency likely to have? One cannot prove that President Obama's policies prevented a Great Depression, a second Great Depression. But when he came into office, when he was elected in 2008, when he came into office at the beginning of 2009, the country was in a state of fiscal crisis. The financial industry was on the verge of meltdown. There were some people who feared that this was a replay of the 1930s. That didn't happen. And I think historians are going to say that the policies that, in part, Obama inherited from George W. Bush, the, the financial, the, the TARP, the bank rescue package, the economic stimulus, those were passed with bipartisan support. And those, I think, and actions by the Federal Reserve that Obama didn't exactly control, but nonetheless, that they were consistent with the policies that he put in power. Um, those, those actions, I think historians are probably going to say, had something to do with the fact that the country did not go into depression. Now, that's a, a kind of a negative accomplishment, a bad thing that didn't happen. But nonetheless, that's very important. 
A second thing is... But I don't know, preempting disaster, that, you know, that always becomes a political football because the disaster didn't happen, so it's left to interpretation, yes? Well, it, well exactly. It's entirely open to interpretation. There are conservatives and Republicans today who say that Franklin Roosevelt's rescue of the banking industry in 1933 really wasn't necessary. Now, people right. who were alive in 1933 thought it was pretty necessary, and there are plenty of Republicans who voted for it. But once the disaster has been averted, then people for partisan and other reasons can say, well, the rescue package really wasn't necessary. Things weren't quite as dire as you said. And there's no way to disprove that. And so this is one where people who are disposed to take alternative views on Obama will argue it both ways. So that's part of it. Um, are second, there some other things that might be an important part of his sure. historical legacy? You bet. Um, the war in Iraq is over. Obama ran for office in 2008 saying he was going to wind down the war in Iraq. He did so successfully. Iraq is not exactly a model of democracy, but neither is it um, involved in a great civil war. So Iraq and the winding down of the war there can definitely be accounted a success. Any president who ends a war on relatively favorable terms gets credit for that. And the war in Afghanistan is winding down. No one knows how that one's going to turn out. But nonetheless, Obama inherited these two wars, and he has ended one already, and he's on track to end the other one. And the third thing is the Affordable Care Act. It's very controversial, but important measures in American social policy have always been controversial. Social Security, when it was passed in 1935, was fully as controversial as the Affordable Care Act. Medicare, when it was passed in 1965, was as controversial as the Affordable Care Act. But both Social Security and Medicare became part of the American political and social landscape. So most seniors cannot imagine life without them. And I suspect that the country is going to get used to the terms of the Affordable Care Act, and 10 years from now they're going to wonder what the big controversy was all about. Right, so the Affordable Care Act will wind up feeling to people uh, 20 years from now, just like we feel about Social Security, we won't question it. Yeah, I mean, once people build these these policies, these programs into their expectations, it is a very bold politician who tries to take them away. I see. So how about all these changes in the president's cabinet? It seems like every other week somebody's stepping down. Is this a bad sign or is this pretty typical as a president takes on a second term? This is standard practice. When presidents get elected the first time, they form a cabinet. And usually they get you know, their first choice. They play with their first string. So every Democrat who had wanted an appointed position lined up and Obama got to pick the very best. It's tough being a member of the cabinet, especially in one of the high-profile positions. Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, and there's a, a burnout phenomenon that occurs all the time. Very often, they don't last the entire first term. The fact that Hillary Clinton is still Secretary of State is a tribute to her stamina, as well as her devotion to the policies of the administration. But you almost always have a changeover at Secretary of State at the end of the first term. You almost always have a changeover someplace like the Treasury. So the number of changes, this is not historically unusual at all. Okay, has there been, ever been a case where there's been such a huge turnover that uh, government sort of came to a pause for a short period of time? I mean, do people need to worry about the transition at all? Well, when there are new people in office, there's always a transition, and transitions sometimes are smoother than others. There's no particular reason to think that this transition is going to be rougher than earlier transitions. The, the time to worry is when people leave abruptly in the middle of a term. So Andrew Jackson fired half of his cabinet yeah. two years into his term. That's not a good sign. <laughs> and, and you don't like high-profile sort of abrupt resignations after a couple of years. When William Jennings Bryan, who was Secretary of State, abruptly left the cabinet of Woodrow Wilson, he resigned in protest. That was not a good sign. Yeah. But when they leave at the end of a first term and there's a natural transition, no one really takes it amiss. Okay, so let's talk about succession for a little bit. I don't know why, but I have a really difficult time imagining Biden would throw his hat in the ring the next time around, as so many vice presidents before him have done. So was the vice presidential role meant to be a path for succession or more of just an insurance in case something were to happen to the president? Well, in fact, no one, even when they wrote the Constitution, knew exactly what the vice president was going to do. His only We still don't. Well, his constitutional role is to be president of the Senate and to break ties. Yeah. And actually, and vice presidents in the early days typically did preside over the Senate. They wielded the gavel and they said who could speak and who couldn't. Aaron Burr, when he was vice president for Thomas Jefferson, 
handled that job with great aplomb. And uh, people greatly respected him for it, even though they didn't respect him for a lot of other things. But the vice president rarely does that these days. If it really is a 50-50 vote, then the, pres- the vice president will show up and cast the tie-breaking vote. But most of the time, the vice president doesn't sit in the Senate. Uh-huh. So the vice presidency was... Well, it was sort of this stand-in in case something happened to the president. But for the first 50 years, nothing did happen to a president. And so when William Henry Harrison, the first president to die in office, died, no one knew exactly what this meant for his vice president, John Tyler. Was he actually president? Was he simply acting president? What exactly was going on? Well, people soon figured out, and Tyler among them, that if you act like a president, that's essentially equivalent to being president. But through the 19th century, the vice presidency was not by any means the obvious stepping stone to the White House. It was more like the black hole of politics where people went in and you never heard from them again. When Theodore Roosevelt was nominated vice president for, for vice president on the Republican ticket in 1900, he was nominated by his political enemies who wanted to put him on the shelf and get him out of the way. It was almost like putting him in a witness protection program where you'd never hear from him again. Roosevelt was so bored by being vice president that he briefly toyed with going back to law school. He, in his early 20s, he had gone to law school and dropped out. And he thought, well, I got time on my hands to go back to law school. Turned out he didn't. It turned out that was a good thing because William McKinley, the, the president, was assassinated shortly and he became president. No, in fact, in the 19th century, the stepping stone of the White House was secretary of state, not vice president. But that's changed. And so now, if you serve two terms as vice president, you're basically the heir apparent to get the nomination. Okay, well, we have to take our last break. When we come back, we're going to find out what history has to tell us about what really makes a good president. You're listening to the Costa Report. Now, here's something to think about. If we're having the same problems in the United States that every other country is struggling with, then are these problems really domestic issues? At what point do we wake up and say, hey, if it's happening to everyone, it means it's happening to our species. That's why I'm asking you to read the Watchman's Rattle, because when you do, you'll see that the very idea that there are domestic and international threats is a myth. All of the problems we face today, problems like unemployment, debt, climate change, terrorism, nuclear proliferation, even the spread of pandemic viruses involve other nations. So please take a moment to pick up the Watchman's Rattle. It's a perspective you'll not find anywhere else, and it offers us solutions you won't find anywhere else. Get the Watchman's Rattle. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. Just about everyone knows that fruits and vegetables are good for our health, but not everyone knows how to build a healthier plate. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, a cookbook author and culinary expert. For each meal, nutrition experts recommend filling half of your plate with fruits and veggies. Whether it's fresh berries with your breakfast cereal, a wrap filled with your favorite roasted vegetables for lunch, or a medley of crunchy veggies for a pre-dinner nibble, Dole provides the freshest and highest quality produce available. When you load up on all the nutritional good stuff, you give your meal an instant boost of color, flavor, and texture, plus vitamins and minerals and fiber, everything your body needs to succeed. For nutritional inspiration and to learn more about Dole's fresh, whole, and cut vegetables and a full line of berries, visit Dole.com. With Dole as your partner in health, the possibilities are endless. Visit Dole.com. It's out with the inside and in with the outside with some help from your friends and neighbors at Ace Hardware. Hello, Charlie Friedman here. You know, there's lots to do to keep the old home front looking good and feeling happy. Got to paint the fence, patch the driveway, fix the drip irrigation, and fertilize the fruit trees. And that's just for starters. Now, I could head across town to that giant box store and spend an hour wandering up and down the aisles, but I won't. Instead, I'll head over to my neighborhood Ace Hardware. They're in Watsonville, Freedom, Marina, Salinas, and Gilroy. These Ace Hardware stores are locally owned by my friends Manuel and Carlos Rodriguez, who are almost always on hand to make sure everything is working right. 
At My Neighborhood Ace, someone will meet me at the door and take me straight to the solution to my homeowner needs. That means I leave with the goods in a bag and a smile on my face. Now, when you find yourself in need of a paintbrush, a screwdriver, or fertilizer, I suggest you head to your neighborhood Ace Hardware store in Watsonville, Freedom, Marina, Salinas, or Gilroy. Think of it as your ace in the hole. Michael Olson's first law of the food chain. Agriculture is the foundation upon which we build all our sandcastles. That's right, folks. No surplus of food, no sandcastles. So before we all get upset from the dust and noise of agriculture, let's get together Saturday at 9 a.m. as the Food Chain Radio Show goes behind the scenes of the industry that keeps us all civilized. If you have a comment about the first law of the food chain, tell me, Michael Olson, all about it at MetroFarm.com. Now, see you all on KSEO Saturday at 9 a.m. for some What's Eating What Radio on the Food Chain. What day was that? Ranger Station. Yeah, hi. I'd like to report a bear sighting in the forest. Uh-huh. One second I'm having a smoke. Next thing I know, I'm face-to-face with Smokey Bear. Wow. And he told me it only takes one spark to start a wildfire. Did you know nine out of ten wildfires are caused by humans? I had no idea. That's why Smokey's famous and you're not. If you see someone in danger of starting a wildfire, step in and make a difference. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Learn more at SmokeyBear.com. Only you can prevent wildfires. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is historian H.W. Brands. Now, in earlier times, the best and brightest had a pathway to get to the top. We talked about Jackson for a bit. But it feels more and more as if raising money has become a really large barrier to getting the brightest our nation has to offer into leadership roles. What's your feeling about that? I mean, surely the money that was spent on this last presidential campaign must have surprised even you. I can't say it surprised me simply because the trend has been developing over time. It's striking, though. I am sometimes asked, since you mentioned you had read my book on Benjamin Franklin, sometimes asked what Franklin would think if he came back to America. Yeah, what would he think? Franklin proposed that holders of federal offices should serve without pay. He was appalled by the idea that money should play a large role in American politics. He and nearly all the other founding fathers, framers of the Constitution, I think would be appalled that to gain elective office, to hold elective office, you have to engage in, especially for members of the House of Representatives, what amounts to endless fundraising. And they would see it as prima facie evidence of openness to bribery because you simply go around and ask for money from the kind of people who are going to be asking things from you. I think they would be quite shocked. Our, our nation's leaders are claiming that they're spending at least 50% of their time even in office raising money. This is something that I cannot think is good for American democracy. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be an easy way around it. The Supreme Court has defined political speech, political advertising as speech, and there is this First Amendment. All right, we're talking about the Citizens United case. Yeah, and related practices and cases. So there, well, for 100 years... There were laws against, for example, corporations contributing to elective, elective campaigns. Yes. Um, but that was lifted in the Citizens United case. And so it does look like offices are going to the highest bidder. And that is a dismaying thing to somebody who's looking for, as to use your term, getting the best and brightest into office. What you really get are the best connected in office, and that's definitely not always the same thing. That's right. Our, our founding fathers, they did a remarkable job of writing a constitution which could be amended and which they expected would evolve with the times. But I don't think they could have imagined that the limits of free speech would be challenged by the Internet or that the right to bear arms might include military-grade automatic assault weapons. And I mean, this is a loaded question, but in your view, how do we reconcile the rights as they're delineated in the constitution with such fast-changing and, and what is arguably a more complex world? I mean, once the constitution can be used to argue both sides of a case is that a sign that maybe it's just too generic of a document to be useful as a as a governing a standard i have no way of proving this but i happen to think that if the, the 55 men who drafted the constitution in the summer of 1787 could come back and discover that we are still using that same constitution they would be shocked 
Remember that these people did not believe in political tradition. These were revolutionaries. They had torn up the old government and tried once, and they like that, and they tried it again. Their, their attitude was each generation should make the government that it finds most suitable. And the idea that their document, now more than 200 years old, should be on this pedestal, and that we cannot come up with a solution to gun problems. We cannot come up with a solution to money in politics because of something that they wrote in 1789. I think they would have said, what's wrong with your generation? We made the changes that we needed. You make the changes you need. And they created an, a mechanism for amendments. I, I don't understand why suddenly if you advocate that there should be change, you're unpatriotic or you're, you're not respecting the founding fathers. I mean, you get labeled and it gets very heated and very emotional very quickly. Well, and the striking thing to remember about the Constitutional Convention itself was that it was not exactly unconstitutional, but it was extra constitutional. In fact, it was convened with a sort of deception. James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, the ones who organized it, they told everybody they were simply going to revise the Articles of Confederation, but they knew fully well they were going to ignore the Articles of Confederation and write a brand new constitution. So if people in our generation had the same nerve, and I would say the same devotion to the public good that that generation had, we would figure out a way to change the Constitution. They, we wouldn't hold up that founding generation as these demigods that we have to follow blindly 200 years later. So, so what's keeping us from doing that in your view? Well, oddly, the very success of the Constitution. We often focus on our problems. But if you look at it from the long term and in the general course of world history, the American system has been amazingly successful. America's system of government has succeeded better, delivering a better life, a freer life, a higher standard of living than any comparable system in history. Before. So is this a case where people are saying, don't fix something that's not broken? Yeah, we focus on the broken part. And at any given time, something's broken. But the fact that there hasn't been a full-scale revision of the Constitution is an indication that by and large, the Constitution works pretty well. And it's only in moments of great crisis, the Civil War of the 1860s, the Great Depression of the 1930s, where people in sufficient numbers realize, boy, something really is broken. Now we need to fix it. At the moment, the system isn't working too well, but a lot of people are still think that it's not broken enough that it requires a You know, if my car starts acting funny, I don't wait till it stops running before I take it to a mechanic. Yeah, but if you own that car with somebody else and you had to split the cost of repairs, and that person might say, you know, I think we can get a few more uh, miles out of the old jalopy. You know, that, that's the thing. And the reason that we're at such gridlock is that the country is pretty evenly divided the, between those who think the government ought to do more and those who think the government ought to do less. And it's in the nature of democracy that when things are evenly divided, not much happens. And that's our current case. Yeah. So so what's the solution? I mean, how does Obama bring the country together during this next week and get us to move forward so that we don't have four more years of gridlock? Most Americans are not especially ideological. If President Obama can reach out over the political parties, over the media, and talk to the people and get people to realize, you know, the reasonable solution to this is – a uh, little bit more taxes, a little bit in spending cuts, and we can make this thing work. Most people, if you sit them down, you get 10 people together, and you say, we've got these opposing views, if they reason among themselves, they'll come up with a compromise. So he's got to go beyond the parties, he's got to go beyond the media, which have an incentive to focus on the controversy, on the gridlock. If he can reach out to the people, then perhaps he can put the feet of members of Congress to the fire and get them to come up with something reasonable. But isn't this a case of just pure chess playing? I, I mean, if the Republicans agree with uh, Obama's policy and his vision, uh, don't they set themselves up four years from now for the Democrats to say, look how successful we've been? And so aren't they just shooting themselves in the foot by cooperating? Don't they have to resist in order to have four years of, of unproductive governance in order to make the case to the American people that the Republican Party should be in charge again? Isn't that really what's going on? What Obama has to do is to raise the cost to the Republicans of not going along because, yeah, what you said is, is one consideration. Another consideration, though, is if the president can paint the Republicans as obstructionists, then he can go to the people four years from now and say, look, 
This party does not have the interests of the American people at heart. They have only their own narrow interests. So he's got to take his case to the people. Exactly. And this is his opportunity, the inaugural address on Monday. And it might be, really, in a fundamental way, his last big opportunity. Well, I sure hope he frames it up in a way that everyone can understand it and and uh, understand and and really grasp the concept that we may have four years of nothing happening, or the Republican Party's just got to get on board and everybody's got to compromise. Not just the Republicans, but the Democrats are going to have to throw in as well. Now, I can't let you go today without telling the audience how to stay in touch with you and uh, to keep tabs on your latest book. How do they get your latest book? Hwbrands.com. Okay, boy, that's really simple. It is. Hey, I allowed three minutes of radio time for you to give all kinds of Facebook addresses, Twitter. No, hwbrands.com. That's it. Yep. All right. Well, that's all the time we've got left. Uh, Before we say goodbye, uh, I want to thank you for taking time to be with us today, and I hope you'll come back. Thank you, Dr. Brands. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. If your station is leaving us after this first hour, my guest next week was the most senior female Republican senator during her tenure and the first female senator from the state of Texas. You want to take a guess? All right, I'm not going to make you guess. That's right. It's Miss Kay Bailey Hutchinson. She'll be here fresh off the heels of her retirement to talk about what needs to be done to stop four more years of gridlock in our nation's capital. So don't miss an exclusive, frank, and very revealing discussion with Kay Bailey Hutchinson next week. Same time, same station, right here on your favorite weekly news program. Now stay tuned for the second hour of the Costa Report when we take your calls and hear what's on your mind. Hi, I'm Judy Profeta, owner, broker, and active real estate agent of Alon Pinnell Realtors, a locally owned real estate company. We've operated on the peninsula for over 16 years, currently located on the corner of Ocean and Dolores and Unipero between 5th and 6th in downtown Carmel. We serve the Monterey Peninsula, focusing on Carmel, Pebble Beach, and the Carmel Valley. Our firm of about 50 agents represents everything from Carmel Cottages to Pebble Beach Estates and oceanfront properties to Valley Vineyards. We are actually known for our vast inventory of fine properties. Drop by and see us, or better yet, visit our website at apr-carmel.com. That's apr-carmel.com. Or you can give us a call at 831 621-1040 and make sure you tell them Judy sent me. The original Stagnero family has been in business since 1879. The Stagnero name stands for quality, quantity, and great service. The family's Gilda's restaurant on the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf is still the fishing headquarters of the Santa Cruz area. It's where fishermen gather each morning for coffee and breakfast before heading out on the bay. Stop by Gilda's and say hi. Dino looks forward to meeting you at Gilda's on the center of the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf. Hello, this is Donald Davidson, the host of the Perspectives Radio Show on Saturday at 12 noon. We have a variety of programs from constitutional rights and issues to controversial alternative health views. We interview well-known authors from many walks of life, attorneys from many fields, and internationally known health doctors. So to hear a different perspective, join me, Donald Davidson, special guests and regular guest hosts every Saturday at 12 noon for the Perspectives Radio Show right here on KSCO. From San Jose to Salinas, Red Hot News Talk, AM 1080, KSCO, Santa Cruz.